Okay, brothers and sisters out there, I want to get into a discussion here called God's Purpose for Israel During the Tribulation. That's what so many people need to realize because so many people are confused into what the Bible teaches because of the many false teachers out there that teach that the church is going through the tribulation. But if you read the Old Testament passages that are dealing with the day of the Lord, the day of wrath, and so on, not once is the church mentioned even one time. We find the church in the book of Revelation, then when it comes to the the events of the tribulation period, it's like as if the church never even existed. It just goes back to Old Testament traditions, it goes back to sacrificing in the, in the rebuilt temple, you have the two witnesses, and that's a very powerful evidence that the church is not present. Because Jesus said to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, that you shall receive, because they, they said, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons, but the Father is put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, and to the ends of the earth. And that has been the church's duty all the way down through history. And yet, when you come to the events of the tribulation period, we have a big problem now. There's no church mentioned. Why in the world do you have the 144,000 Jews? You see? What's it say in Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7? Alice, for that day is great. For it is the time of what? The church's trouble? No. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's very clear. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. <coughs> he, speaking of Israel. You see, it's still called Jacob. You say, what are you trying to say here? Well, if you go to 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 34, Jacob's name was Jacob when he was an unbeliever. When he got saved, God changed his name to Israel. Okay? So just the fact that it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Now why is that? Because there's still an unbelief. That's why. There's still an unbelief. Because every time the Jews disobeyed God, something devastating happened. They were sent into Babylon for 70 years, and so on. They disobeyed them again. What happened? God warned them, if you do not return back to me, you continue worshipping your idols, and so on. He rose up prophets, as prophets warn them, that if you don't return to the Lord, He's going to scatter you to the four corners of the earth. And that's exactly what happened. You can verify that by secular history, that the Jews were scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. And do you ever notice that it's not the, it's not the Japanese people, it's not the Muslims, it's not the Mexicans, it's not the Philippines, it's not the Italians, it's not the Germans, it's not the Russians. Who are the most hated people in the world that have been literally butchered and almost gone out of existence? It's the Jews. Now why is that? Many people don't understand why. Why is that? Because God made an everlasting promise. What did the angel Gabriel say to uh, the Virgin Mary? Your son shall be great and he shall rule over the house of Jacob forever. Now, Satan knows that if he can destroy the nation of Israel, he can prevent the second coming. And Jesus also said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the second coming cannot occur until the Jews acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Messiah. You see? Jesus Christ cannot return to set up his 1,000 year reign millennial kingdom until the Jews get saved. <laughs> why in the world do you have to throw the church in there? As, why do you have to drag the church along with the Jews? There's no mention of the church. Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. You see, during the tribulation period, they're not going to be preaching the gospel that we're preaching today. They're going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the second coming. The king is coming to set up his kingdom. You better repent of your sin and get right with God because Jesus Christ is about to return and when he comes back, he's coming back to judge sin. 
Okay? That's going to be the judgment of the nations, etc. Like it says, when he comes back, taking vengeance on those that do not know God and those that do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so on. But anyways, the church is nowhere to be found. You have the angels preaching the gospel. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, to every nation, town, everywhere. You have the two witnesses, which I believe will be Moses and Elijah. Because why in the world? Because some people think it's going to be Enoch. But Enoch was a Gentile. Why in the world would God use a Gentile to preach to a Jewish nation? And the Jews highly respect Moses. It's going to be Elijah and Moses. And the 144,000 are sealed. Where's the church being sealed? Where's the billions and billions of church members? Nowhere. Why? Because the rapture took place. We're not here. It's very clear on that topic. And all through the book of Revelation, God is pouring out wrath. Okay? Because some people try to say, oh, it's not, it's not the wrath of God. Well, it is. Because it's still, after these plagues, they still did not repent of their deeds. They blasphemed God who had power over these plagues. Are you trying to tell me that God's going to pour out his wrath at the end of the tribulation? Like many of these post-tribulation rapture thieves try to tell you? How is he going to pour out seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bolts? when at the second coming is when he ushers in his millennial kingdom. It's ridiculous. Are you trying to tell me they're going to be crying out, Peace and safety! Peace and safety! You know, what's the Bible say? For when they say, not us, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. They shall not escape what? Hmm? They shall not escape what? You see? They shall not escape the wrath of God. It's just so clear. It's just so clear. <clears throat> but anyways, I want to show you clearly. Now, this is talking about the Jews, and then we're going to get into this topic here. If you go to the book of Deuteronomy, okay? Look what it says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4. I'm going to start from verse 26. Right here. Look at this. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon eagerly perish from the land which, which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not plunder your days in it, but will be eagerly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you'll be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve God the work of your okay, the work of man's hand, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But look at this. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now verse 30. Listen to what verse 30 says. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 30. When you are in distress. Now another translation says for when you are in tribulation. Okay. When you are in distress. And all these things come upon you. In the latter days. When you turn. You see that? When you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice. This is not talking about something that took place in the past. Like these predators try to say, everything was fulfilled in 70 AD. Huh, really? Are the Jews today in Israel right with God? It says, in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God? No, the Jews do not obey. Go, go, to, go to Israel today and start preaching to an Orthodox Jew. It won't take long before they start stoning you or whatever. Hmm, believe me. That's why the, the time period that is coming is called the time of Jacob's trouble. And the Jews require a sign. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. That's why the Jews require a sign. That God's going to get. God's going to confirm to them this New Testament. They're going to see all the events of the Bible being fulfilled right before their very eyes. Now it says, they will seek the Lord their God in the latter times. Now let's go to um, Zechariah. 
because it talks about that, about how many Jews are going to be saved. Just a few, a remnant. But before I get to that, I want to read to you from uh, Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. This is what it says, okay? Hosea chapter 5, verse 15 says, listen to this. I will return again. So, in order for you to return again, you had to be there in the first place. Now, this is talking about Jesus returning back to heaven. What does he say? I will return again to my place till they, speaking of the Jews, till they acknowledge their offense. Hmm. The Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah. They offended him big time. Remember it says in, in the Gospel of John, He came unto his own, his own received him not. So I will return again to my place Till they acknowledge their offense. Look at this. Then they will seek my face. In what? In their affliction. They will eagerly seek me. Then if we go to the book of Zechariah. You see? That's why Satan's trying to wipe them out. Because Satan knows Bible prophecy. He knows it's going to happen. Zechariah. Chapter... 13 verse 8 look at this and it shall come to pass in all the land says the Lord that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die but one-third shall be left in it I will bring the one-third through the fire will will refrain them as silver is refrained and test them as gold is tested they will what they will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. Right there from Scripture. You see? <clears throat> you see, there was an exodus that took place. God delivered the people out of Egypt. Now, there's coming another exodus. Okay? If you go to Revelation chapter 12, it explains that, but I don't want to get into that right now. I made a video on that as well. Revelation chapter 12. What's it called? Because the Antichrist knows his time is short. Well, Satan's going to be cast out of heaven. That's when he's going to enter into the Antichrist. He's going to possess his body. He knows that his time is short. He only has 42 months. So he's going to go on a rampage. He's going to try to take out all the Jews. But God supernaturally is going to protect them. In the wilderness. Just like he did in the Old Testament times. That's why everything's going back as it was in the Old Testament times. <laughs> but anyway, even that, okay, I want to get into that part too right now. The Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah, okay? They rejected him. He came unto his own, his own received him not. That's why Jesus wept over the city. He didn't want that stuff to happen to them. That's why the destruction came, because of their rejection. So, God has left them aside for now. God has put them aside for now. That's why there's a time gap. When Jesus, in Daniel chapter 9, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the very day that Daniel prophesied. That's when the time gap stopped. 69 weeks have already passed. There's one more week left for Israel. People need to understand that. It's for Israel. It's not for the church. Right now, God is fulfilling promises to the church, okay? Right now, God's program is running for the church. God still has promises that He has left to be fulfilled for the nation of Israel. The very purpose for the tribulation is for the Jews to come into salvation. We're already saved. What's the very purpose for the tribulation? For God to pour out His wrath upon a Christ-rejected world, and to cleanse evil out. It's to pour out wrath. It's, pour, it's God judging sin. But yet, God already judged sin at the cross. There's no purpose for the church to be here. That's why the church age is going to end at the rapture of the church. And you're going to have the Jewish nation, Israel, that's going to be the center of the nations during the tribulation period. And you can't have the church in Israel running around at the same time. And guess what? God has never done that ever before in human history. 
Never. He's never worked with two groups of people at the exact same time. That's why he worked with Israel, because they rejected him. He's called a, he called out a people for himself, a Gentile. <clears throat> as it says in the book of Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts. <clears throat> Acts chapter 15. I'll start from verse 13. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Man and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God, listen, how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, after what? You see, after what? After God is dealing with the Gentiles. What is he going to do? After this, I will return. How can you return to something if you weren't there in the first place? You can't. An example. I leave my house. After this, I'm going to come back. Same thing. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. God's going to return back to the nation of Israel. And God has only worked with one group of people at once. He's never worked with two groups of people. God's not going to do something here that he's never done before. It's, it's straight in Scripture. Has there ever been a rapture before? Thanks for asking that question. Yes, there has. Enoch was taken. It says Enoch walked with God. He was not for God took him. It's rapture. God took Elijah. You can see the rapture all through the Bible. Yeah, but you can't find the word rapture in the Bible. That's what so many people say. Well, guess what? You can't find any English word in the Bible. Read the original Bible. You can't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but it's there. Rapture just means to be taken, to be caught up, quickly be removed. That's all that it means. It's harpazo in the original Latin, or the language that it was written in. But anyways, go to the book of Romans. This is what Paul had to say. Because the Jews rejected Jesus. They're in temporary blindness for now. He's going to deal with them at this time period that is coming, which is the time of Jacob's trouble. This is what Paul had to say in uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to who? has happened to Israel until, until what? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When that last person comes into the body of Christ, the rapture will take place, and then what's going to happen? And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. So God's going to focus his attention back on the nation of Israel. Scripture is so, so, so clear. The Deliverer will come out of Zion. Who's the Deliverer? Well, it's Jesus, obviously. And he will what? Turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. Their sin. Our sins are already taken away. That was already taken care of at the cross. Now, I want to cover this, and then we're going to get into this, because so many people try to say, uh, what's it called? Like these lies, pre-wrath. The first half of the tribulation is man's wrath and Satan's wrath. Well, let me tell you something. Open up your Bible and read plain English. Let's see about that, if it's man's wrath or Satan's wrath. Let's read Revelation chapter 6. Now I saw when the Lamb, huh, the Lamb, who's the Lamb? Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Hmm. That's no other than Jesus Christ. Are you trying to tell me? That Jesus is literally going to pour out his wrath on his own body again? What are you talking about? Think about it. Think about this, okay? When Paul was persecuting, killing Christians, when he went to ask the priest that he can go to Damascus to see if he can find any Christians there and bring them back to execute them, what happened on his way to Damascus? A light shined upon him, which was Jesus Christ. And he said, Saul, Saul, why do you what? 
why do you persecute me? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus. Who are you persecuting? He wasn't literally persecuting Jesus. He was, he was persecuting Christians. So it was like as if he was persecuting him. Because we're all one in the body of Christ. If you go to Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, at the judgment of the nations, what does Jesus say to them? For I was hungry, you never gave me any food. I was naked, you never gave me any clothes. I was in prison, you never visited me. I was sick, and so on. He's like, Lord, when did we ever see this and never do this to you? As much as you did it unto these my brethren, you did it unto me. So you're trying to tell me that God's going to pour out his wrath upon his body again? So basically, Jesus is going to destroy his own body. So the righteous and the wicked are going to receive, they're going to receive the same exact punishment. These people are trying to pick, they're trying to make God to look out to be a monster. Yeah, I love you, I'm married to you, but before I bring you home, I'm going to beat the crap out of you. How do you like that for a bride? <clears throat> I don't think anyone would ever go with somebody like that. Yeah, we're to be looking for the blessed hope. Hmm, what blessed hope? I love you. I'm married to you. But you know what? Before I bring you home to be with me, I'm going to pour my wrath on you. How do you like that? God does not beat up his bride. Okay? <laughs> That's for the wicked. Do an in-depth study from Genesis to Revelation. God has never, ever poured out his wrath upon the wicked. With the righteous. He's always called his, out, his own out before, and then he's unleashed his wrath. It just, it, it's just incredible of what people are doing to God's word. Like, it's crazy. But look what it says in Revelation chapter 6. Like these pre-wrathers, all the first half of the tribulation is Satan's wrath and man's wrath. Well, let's see about that. Because we're the ones that are in Revelation chapter 5 singing the new song. Look what it says, 9 to 10. And they sang a new song, sing. You are worthy to take the squirrel and to open its what? Seals. For you were slain, talking about his death on the cross, and have redeemed us. He's redeemed us. By what? You redeemed us to God by your what? By your blood. Out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, nobody can sing this song except the redeemed. It's clear. Redeemed us out of out of every tribe, tongue, that's the whole world, man. That makes up the body of Christ. Anyways, let's just get into this, okay? Look what it says, Revelation chapter 6 here. What does it say? Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. The first seal is the Antichrist. So, you're trying to tell me? And then go to verse 15. Look at this. And the kings of the earth, the great man, the rich man, the commanders, the mighty man, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on, why are they saying this if it's the wrath of man and Satan? Hide us and, yeah, hide us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Yeah, exactly. Explain. And who is able to stand? He says, God will never tempt you beyond what you are able to. And yet, who is able to stand? Jesus, man's hearts will be failing them. And in the book of Haggai, he says that he will shake heaven and earth. And in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, let's go there quickly. That's why I'm going to do another video soon after to get into this. Because before Jesus returns to set up his kingdom, he's going to be dealing directly with sin. Okay? He's going to be dealing directly with sin. But listen to this, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 10. Look at this. Yeah, people say we're going through the tribulation. Yeah. These people don't know anything about God's word. Look at this, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the everlasting King. Look at this. At His wrath, the earth will tremble, and the nations will not be able to endure His anguish. Will not be able to. 
Like, there's just so many things, man. So many things. Like, there's another verse. Is it 2631? Maybe it's 46. I'm not sure, though. Let me see if I can find it. Forty six. No, I can't find it right now. But anyways, you see right there, it says clear, but it's the wrath of the Lamb. And here's another lie, the mid trib. It's all they're all thieves. They're all stealing things that God made directly to the nation of Israel. It's the seventieth week of Daniel. It's God pouring out his wrath upon sin. Okay? <clears throat> these lies that these people say, oh, the first half of the tribulation, it's man's wrath. There's no wrath. That's not God's wrath, really. Look at the seven seals. They ignore the seven seals. They ignore the trumpet judgments. And yet they say, the last trumpet, we're out of here. Really. So they're ignoring Revelation 8, Revelation 9, where a third of the earth is killed. And in one of the seal of judgments, over a fourth of the earth. That's like half of the earth has been annihilated. And they say, oh, only the wrath, God's wrath, the last half of the tribulation. Yeah, right. Now let's see about this. Because they're trying to say that 1 Corinthians chapter um, 15 for Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, for the last trump will sound. They're trying to say that. It's the last trump of Revelation chapter 11, which is totally ridiculous. John did not even write the book of Revelation at that time. <clears throat> and the people in Paul's day understood what he was talking about. But anyways, they say when the last trump of Revelation 11 sounds, boom, we're out of here. Let's find out about that. Let's read it right now. Let me start from verse 9, talking about the two witnesses when they get killed. When they get killed. And those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. Then those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who, dwell on the, who, who saw them. And they heard a loud voice. Huh. They just heard a voice. Really? Where's the trumpet? Because they're stupid. They're trying to say that these two witnesses is representing the church. It's, it's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. This talking about the two prophets has nothing to do with the church. But anyways, look what it says. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven. Huh. Where's the, where's the dead in Christ and the living being caught up? Where's the voice of the archangel? Where's the shout? It's not there at all. Heaven in a clap. Look at this. Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. Huh, really? They saw them? It didn't happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? Okay. Enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell in the earthquake. Seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Huh. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. But look at this. This is what so many people ignore. So... They're already gone into heaven. But look what happens after they're already gone into heaven. The two witnesses. Look at this. Verse 15. Then. Look at that. Then the seven angels sounded. And there were many voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and our earth. After the two witnesses are gone up, the seven trumpet is sounded. There's no mention of any translation here. It's ridiculous. 
Okay, that's the midrib lie. So we saw the pre-rap lie, which is very clear. And now the post-trib rapture thieves. Jesus is going to come back at the very, very, very end. So they have the whole entire church going through the tribulation, which is a lie from the pit of hell. Now think about if that was true for a moment. That means you yup, up and down. You go up and you do a U-turn. What's the very purpose of going up? If you're just going to come back down, but you're just going to you're going to bump into each other. What's the point of going up? There is no purpose whatsoever. Why don't you just go straight into the millennium? There's no judgment seat of Christ. How in the world are you getting crowns? The judgment seat of Christ. At the second coming, it's the judgment of the nations. In Jesus said in John chapter 14, If I go away, I will come again and receive unto myself that where I am, there you also may be. Where is he? He's in heaven. Why is he preparing mansions for you if you're not going to be in those mansions? Because believe me, when Jesus comes back at the second coming, everybody's going to be drawn to him at the judgment of the nation. But Jesus is clearly talking to believers here. But let's just suppose it did happen, okay? That means you go up and down. Okay, there's a bit, there's many problems. Matthew chapter 13 says that the terrors are taken first and they are burned. It's the wicked that are taken to judgment first. And if that was the case, that means you go up and down. Therefore, Matthew chapter 25 31, where it says Jesus separates the sheep and goats. There'd be no reason for separation because if a rapture did occur, that would have accomplished the separation. Therefore, you have a resurrected body. Therefore, there's no one left to populate the millennium. Because when Jesus says, Depart from me, you curse into everlasting fire, prepare for the wicked, for the devil and his angels. Hmm, you got a big mess on your hands. Who in the world is going to populate the millennium? Nobody. And where in the world does Satan get all those people after the thousand years? It says that he gathers more people than there is on the sand of the seashore. It's totally, it's, un, it's a non-event. There's no mention of the dead being raised. There's no mention of the living being translated. And after the second coming, the dead are being raised. Revelation chapter 20. Anyways, that's what the Word of God teaches. That's not my theology. That's not my opinion. That's what the Word of God says. God's not going to beat the crap out of you. Say, okay, come on now. It's ridiculous. It's a satanic heresy, a post-trib and mid-trib and all that crap. That's exactly what it is. It's crap. It's a lie from the pit of hell. But anyways, let's get into this. The purpose for the tribulation period. God's purpose for Israel during the tribulation. Okay. The great tribulation, past or future, because these people try to say, oh, everything was fulfilled in 70 A.D. So let's get into this, okay? The tribulation as the future time was that one of the biblically defiled purposes for the seven-year tribulation as the future time. Was that when? Was that one of the biblically defined purposes of the seven-year tribulation period as it relates to Israel did not occur in the first century. So just what God's purpose for Israel during the tribulation to purge out the rebel. One of the major divine purposes for the tribulation in relation to Israel is the conversion of the Jewish remnant to faith in Jesus as their Messiah. This will take place throughout the tribulation, but by the end of the seven-year period, the entire number of the elect remnant will become converted to Jesus. That number is likely a third of the Jewish people, like we read before in Zechariah. As noticed in Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9, and, and I will bring the third part through the fire, refrain them as silver is refrained, <clears throat> and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. 
I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God as part of the progress of bringing the Jewish remnant to faith Zechariah chapter 13 verse 8 speaks of a purging out of a non-elect Jewish remnant from from the nation and it will come about in all the land declares the Lord that two parts in it will be cut off and perish but the third will be left in it the Old Testament prophets spoke frequently of the purging out of the Jewish non-elect <clears throat> during the tribulation Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 33 to 38 is a major passage that speaks of the Jewish regathering to the ancient land which must take place before the tribulation in preparation for the for the purging of the non-elect Israelites called in this passage the rebels chapter Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 38 as I as as I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, look at this, with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. I shall bring you out from the people and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out I shall bring you into the w into the wilderness of the people and there I shall and there gather you from the people to their arms and with, I shall enter into judgment with you face to face as I enter into judgment with your fathers in the in the wilderness of the land of Egypt so I will enter into judgment with you declares the Lord God and I shall make you plunder the rod and shall bring you into the bound of the covenant and I shall perform the rebels and those who transgress against me Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 33 to 38 the prize to pass under the rod is one of the even the separation the progress will result in the removal of the rebel leaving the believing remnant who will there be brought into the bound of the covenant Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 37 in a familiar vein to two chapters later Ezekiel receives another revelation about a future regathering of the national Israel Ezekiel chapter 22 17 to 22 this time the Lord is going to is going to to gather you into the midst of Jerusalem Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 19 like the meeting the Lord will use the fire of the tribulation to purge out the unfaithful the Lord is going to gather you Israel and blow on you with the fire of my wrath wow, this is powerful stuff and you will be melted the mist of it Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 21 in this passage my wrath disposed the time of the tribulation it also follows here the nation must be regathered before that event can take place well, obviously it's common sense so that is where Ezekiel yeah Ezekiel chapter 22 19 the tribulation it also follows here that the nation must be regathered before that event can take place the outcome of this event will be that the nation will know that I the Lord have poured out my wrath on 
you. Ezekiel chapter 22. Imagine this. It's going to happen, people. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 22. Israel is back in her land, awaiting the purging fire of the tribulation that will remove the non elect and revive, revive too. Again, we read the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Exactly. The time of Jacob's trouble. It is said to compose the sorrow that one faces in childbirth, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, but he will be saved from it. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 to 11, the remnant will be saved through this time of trouble, which is clearly the tribulation. The Lord will chastise the nation of the church, no, the nation of Israel during this time only I will not destroy you completely this is powerful look at this. I will not destroy you completely but I will chastise you justly and will by no means leave you unpunished this chastisement will result in Israel's conversion and you shall be my people and I will be your God Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 22 Jeremiah says that these signs will occur in the latter days. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 24. The prophets of Dan the prophets of Daniel 12 are set within the time frame of the tribulation. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. Many will be purged, purified and refrained, but the wicked will act wickedly undone of the wicked and will understand but those who have insight will understand Daniel chapter 12 verse 10 we see in this passage the counted time frame of purging out the non-elect Jewish during the tribulation but also see the rescue or salvation of the elect these events a side occurred during the end time Daniel chapter 12 verse 9 a number of the passage speaks of the need to refrain the Jewish people often associated with the city of Jerusalem Isaiah chapter 1 verse 22 25 48 10 Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 27 to 30 9 and 7, Malachi chapter 3, verse 2 to 3. Arnold Fuchtenbaum tells us as a purified, believing nation, they will then turn to the Lord. Here again, he speaks of worldwide regathering in unbelief and preparing for Pacific future judgment. But the purpose of the judgment is to bring them to national repentance first considering for the second Christians are surprised to learn that the second coming is a rescue yeah is a rescue event Jesus will return to planet earth in order to rescue the believing Jewish remnant that isn't the verge of being that's on the verge of being destroyed the campaign of Armageddon I think this is what Paul speaks of in Romans 10 when he tells us whatever will call yeah whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Romans chapter 10, verse 13 to 14. In other words, the Jewish people are going to have to be believers in Jesus as their Messiah in order to be rescued by him. The second, the second advent, this 
is exactly what will happen. The Old Testament teaches that before Christ can return to earth for his millennial kingdom, the nation of Israel must be converted to Jesus as their <coughs> Messiah and call on him to save them. This is thought throughout the Bible. Leviticus chapter 26 verse 40 to 42, Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 11 to 18, Hosea chapter 5 verse 15, Zechariah 12 10, Matthew 23 verse 37, Acts chapter 3 verse 19 and 21, Hosea 5 15 tells us, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge acknowledge their guilt and seek my face in their affliction. They will eagerly seek me until until tells us the nation will one day turn to the Lord, as does the following context. Jesus himself spoke an important until the nation in Matthew twenty three Matthew twenty three to thirty nine when he said, For I say to you, <clears throat> from now on you shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Apostle Peter tells us, tells the Jewish nation that they will see Jesus again until they repent, therefore, and return, that your sins may be blotted away, in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you who, whom heaven must receive the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke of by the mouth of the mouth of okay, the mouth of the second coming, yeah, the mouth of okay. the second coming. Israel must confess her national sin. Explain the Fukdom bomb. Okay. Please, for the Messiah to return to Mount for him as one mourns for an only son. The national conversion of Israel. The Bible teaches that one day the nation of Israel will return to the Lord their God. This will occur by the end of the tribulation and is the purpose for the time of Jacob's trouble. Many passages teach that the future conversion of the Jews to Jesus as their Messiah. But there's so many, there's so many. Okay, where was it? Conversion of the Jews to their Messiah. There's Psalms 79 verse 1 to 13, 80, like there's so many scriptures here. Hosea chapter 6 verse 1 to one of the most interesting passages on the future conversion of the nation of Israel. Come let us return to the Lord for he has torn us but he will heal us. He has wounded us but he will beg us. He will Revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that he may live before him. Conclusion. The Bible clearly teaches that the, that the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation in which non-elect Jews are to be purged out and removed while the remaining believing remnant will be saved both spiritually and physically did not <clears throat> did not through everything to be destruction yeah destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD like the predators try to say you say everything was fulfilled in 70 AD it's ludicrous it's crazy people are crazy that believe that stuff you know but try as those okay, cannot well, I'm claiming just in the context of scripture. Just do not justify the prior future fulfillment for a literal nation of Israel. 
took them, Baum says, only by faith in the Son of Man can Israel be regathered only by calling upon his name, the name of the Lord, Israel be saved. Spiritually only by the return of the Son of Man can Israel be saved physically. Yet, that is exactly what will occur in the future. In the tribulation, the Lord is setting the stage for these future events since he brought his chosen people back to their land in anticipation of both the purging of the so this is all I gotta say so God bless and thank you all for watching and uh, that's the purpose for Israel for the tribulation is for them to come to know Jesus imagine it's gonna take the tribulation for it's going to take a big event like that for them to come to know Jesus. So that's all i got to say. And brothers and sisters out there, live ready, stay ready, be ready for the coming of the Lord. Because Jesus is coming back very soon. And that's all i got to say. And God bless.